is a joy to be with you this morning. We're going to be beginning our new study of the book of Acts. And so please turn with me in your copy of God's word to Acts chapter 1. We'll be looking at Acts 1, verses 1 through 5, which can be found in page 1080 in the Pew Bibles in front of you as well. And my friend Victor is going to be uploading my sermons to YouTube, so he asked me to introduce myself to his audience there. My name is James Atterbury, and I'm the preaching pastor of Amargosa Christian Fellowship, and our church is a part of Village Missions, which is an organization that helps rural churches like ours. So I've been the pastor here for the past five years, and I have a beautiful wife, Katie, whom I married in 2018. And so I'm committed to the expository preaching of God's word, which means preaching through the Bible, verse by verse, and applying it to our lives today. And so if you're able to, let us stand for the reading of God's word out of Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And Luke says, by the Holy Spirit, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them, after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we approach you humbly and yet boldly because Christ has gone before us to prepare a place for us in heaven. He intercedes at your right hand, ever ready and willing to forgive us when we sin against him. May we keep a close walk with Christ every day, ever mindful of what we have been saved from. Never let us lose sight of our great Savior. Or forget that apart from him, we have nothing and can do nothing. We thank you for breaking us safely through another week and sustaining us every hour. Open our minds to know the scriptures, to read them with understanding, and be made more like Jesus through them. Reveal to us by scripture, O God, your works, ways, and words, that we would know you as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as you truly are, and not based on what the world thinks about you. Give to us the saving knowledge of Jesus. Acquaint us with his love and compassion, and see the Father's love in the Son, that we would rest in Christ's finished work. By your Spirit, may we be brought safely into a greater fellowship with you. Lead us into all truth through your word, and turn us from every error. May we better learn how to share your love with others, warn those who are straying, and call sinners back to you. Help us to believe that in Christ, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Lead us from one degree of faith to another, that we would always see you as our loving Father. Grant us peace in the midst of our suffering, faith in the midst of our doubts, and purity in the midst of a corrupt and evil world. Open our hearts to the truths of this passage, O Lord, and grant us wisdom as a church as we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. And we ask for all these things in his name and for his glory by the Spirit's power. Amen. And you may be seated. The book of Acts is part of our history. As believers in Jesus, we should care about the history of the church because the history of the church is our history as well. The Bible is a historical book that is grounded and rooted in historical facts, not the speculations of man. You see, Christianity is a faith that is built on events that happened in real history. Jesus Christ walked the earth 2,000 years ago, and he is alive right now. 
but the other religions of the world are not based on history. They are instead based on the ideas of men and their philosophy. And the history of the book of Acts, written by Luke, corresponds with what we know from other writers of history. The events, people, and places of the book of Acts correspond with what we know from real history. And there's a famous scholar of the book of Acts in the New Testament named Sir William Ramsey. And William Ramsey traveled throughout the Mediterranean world, and he visited all the cities and places described for us in the book of Acts. And he came to the conclusion that Luke was a first-rate historian, and that he is an historian equal to any historian of ancient history. His words can be relied upon, and they are extremely precise, even to the minute detail. And as Christians, we should desire to study history for many different reasons. We should want to study history because we want to avoid the mistakes of the past. We want to avoid falling into the errors of those who came before us, to learn from their mistakes and sins so that we don't repeat them ourselves. And we should want to study history as Christians because we want to learn more about the great Christians who have come before us. We should want to imitate their faith. We should want to be like them and to imitate their prayer life and their dependence upon God, to learn about them more and to be inspired and encouraged in our own walk with God. The book of Acts is the continuation of the Gospel of Luke. And so Luke and Acts have the same author. And so the book of Acts is really volume two of a two-volume work. The first volume is about Jesus, and the second volume is about the history of the early church. And the book of Acts is extremely important for us for many different reasons. And one of the reasons why Acts is so important is because it is a powerful witness to the historical reliability of the Gospels. You see, the book of Acts was completed before 70 AD because the book of Acts ends suddenly in chapter 8 in the middle of Paul's ministry. The book of Acts never records for us the death of Paul or the death of Peter or the death of James, the brother of Jesus. But it does record the death of James, the brother of John. When the uh, apostle... Now, James died, the brother of John. Acts records this for us. But it never records the deaths, deaths of Peter, Paul, or James, the brother of Jesus, who all died as martyrs for their faith before 70 AD. And the book of Acts never records the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so if Acts was written after 70 AD, why would Luke choose to leave out such important details? And so the only conclusion we can come to is that Luke wrote Acts before 70 AD. And if that is the case, then the Gospel of Luke 2 must have been written before 70 AD, because Luke was written before Acts was. And therefore, the Gospel of Luke and the Gospels as a whole were written during the lifetime of the original disciples of Jesus. And so if there were things in the Gospels that were untrue, if they contained fictional events about Jesus, then the original disciples of Jesus would have known and they would have corrected these errors. They would have said something if there were things in the Gospels that were not true. There was not enough time for myths and legends about Jesus to develop when the original disciples of Jesus were still alive when the Gospel of Luke was written. And so let us begin by looking at verse 1 together, where Luke begins his second book. Let us be, begin by looking at Acts chapter 1, verse 1. And Luke says this in verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. The book of Acts is written to a man named Theophilus. And of course, even though the Acts is addressed to Theophilus, it is not meant for him alone. It was meant to be, be read and studied by all. And often in the ancient world, when you would write a book, you would begin with a dedication. You would dedicate your book to someone. And the person whom you dedicate it to was not meant to be the only person who would read it. It was written to them, but not just to them, but to others as well. And the de dedication would be written to the person who would pay for the writing of that book and its distribution. 
And so Theophilus was likely the person who paid for the writing of Luke and Acts. He is the patron of Luke. He helped support Luke and provide for his needs and pay for the writing and distribution and copying of the Gospels of Luke and Acts. And this would have cost tens of thousands of dollars to produce Luke and Acts. Writing in the ancient world was not cheap, and it was not cheap to make copies of Luke and distribute them to the churches because there were no copy machines back then. There was no printing press. And so you had to hire scribes who would make copies of these books so they could, they could be distributed to others. And so every early church would have a copy of Luke and Acts. And Theophilus was the one whom I believe paid for the writing of these books. Theophilus was a man who was blessed by God. He had great resources financially, and he used his money to advance the kingdom of God by paying for Luke's needs and supporting him financially and supporting financially the writing of these books and their copying. And the name Theophilus in Greek means friend of God. Theos means God and Philos means friend. He is a friend of God and the name Theophilus was a common name in the first century. He was God's friend. And as Christians today, we too are God's friend. Theophilus was not the only friend of God. We are friends of God and friends of Jesus Christ and friends of his Holy Spirit. God is our friend because of what Jesus Christ did for us. At one time, we were enemies of God. We were far from God, but we've been brought near by the blood of Christ. God is our friend when formerly we were his enemies. We were alienated and hostile to God. We were slaves of Satan and sin, but God set us free by his Holy Spirit. God has set us free, and we are friends of God because of what he has done for us. And notice here how Luke chooses to begin the book of Acts. He says that his previous book, the Gospel of Luke, was about all that Jesus began to do and teach. The Gospel of Luke was just the beginning of the, book of, uh, of the ministry of Jesus. The Gospel of Luke was just the beginning. Luke was just the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, but not the end. And so by saying that Luke was what he, Jesus began to do and teach, what he's implying is that Jesus is Christ is still active in his church today. Luke was, what it was about what Jesus began to do, and Acts is going to be the continuation of the ministry of Jesus. We see in the book of Acts, Jesus Christ still at work in our world today. Through the Holy Spirit, through the church, which is the body of Christ, and through his own intervention, Jesus Christ intervenes in the book of Acts personally, as we see in the conversion of Saul, who was a persecutor of the church in chapter 9. Jesus Christ is not done in our world today. He is not done building his church. He is still at work today in our lives. Jesus Christ is alive. He has risen from the dead, and he is doing miracles even today. Through the church today, Jesus is at work rescuing sinners from hell. And Jesus Christ is with us today. He said in the Great Commission that I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with us even now. He said, where two or three are gathered, there I am among them. He is with us in his church, and he is everywhere at once, because as God, he is omnipresent. He is everywhere, and so he can be with us every step of our lives, and he will never, ever leave us. He is with you in your trials and your suffering. He is with you in your misery and your pain. He will never leave you or forsake you, and you can trust him in your suffering. You can trust him in the pain that you go through, because he is with you every step of the way. And he understands the suffering you are going through. He knows what it is like firsthand to walk the earth and to suffer pain and rejection as a man. And then Luke goes on in verses 2 and 3, and he summarizes for us the ministry of Jesus after the resurrection. Luke writes in verses 2 and 3, Until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To them he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days 
and speaking about the kingdom of God. The focus of the ministry of Jesus after his resurrection for 40 days was all about teaching the apostles about the kingdom of God. In his teaching, he is preparing them for the day of Pentecost and for the suffering that they would endure after the Pentecost until the day they would die as martyrs for Jesus. Jesus Christ here is preparing them for the great task that lay ahead of them. And here the disciples are called apostles. And the word apostle literally means in Greek, one who is sent out by another person to carry out a task. They are those who are sent out. And the verb apostello in Greek means to send. So they are, they are those who are sent by Jesus and commissioned by him to carry out this great task of preaching his gospel and performing miracles that point to the truth of his resurrection from the dead. And these are referred to as the 11 apostles. Originally, there were 12 disciples, but now there are only 11 after Judas hanged himself. And these 11 apostles, including Matthias, whom we'll talk about later, who would take the place of Judas, would go out to the ends of the earth to preach the gospel and do miracles and to witness for Jesus. And the term witness is also the word for martyr. They would be martyrs or witnesses for Jesus, who would testify to Jesus until the shedding of their blood, testifying and sealing by their deaths their sincerity and the genuineness of their faith in Jesus, that they truly believed and were willing to suffer for him unto death. They truly believed he was raised from the dead and that they saw the risen Jesus with their very own eyes. And Jesus Christ would teach these disciples for 40 days, and what was the subject of his teaching? What did he talk with them about? Well, Luke tells us it was about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is the focus of the ministry and teaching of Jesus. He would teach them about all that he taught them previously in the four gospels. He would remind them of his, his teachings. And I'm sure as well that he taught them how to rightly interpret the Old Testament. Jesus would show them how the Old Testament points to him and how he is the fulfillment of all of the promises of God and all the prophecies of old. And we see that on the road to Emmaus, where Jesus would walk with two of his disciples and show them all that was written about him and the law and the prophets and the writings. Jesus opened their eyes to see how the Old Testament is really all about him and how he has come to fulfill the promises of old. And they are called to go and to show others the fulfillment of messianic prophecy through the ministry of Jesus and how only Jesus could fulfill all these things and the fulfilled prophecies together with the miracles are the proof of his resurrection and that he truly is the Messiah of God. He is the promised one of old and the King of Israel. And 40 days later, he would ascend into heaven. And then 10 days after that, Pentecost would occur when Jesus would send the Holy Spirit in power to equip them and to give them the boldness they would need to preach the gospel and do miracles. And the number 40 in the Bible is a very important number. The number 40 in the Bible is often associated with testing. Jesus Christ himself was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And that corresponds to Israel being in the wilderness for 40 years as they were tried and as they went through testing themselves and Israel failed the test. Israel grumbled in the wilderness and complained, but Jesus Christ, when he was in the wilderness for 40 days, passed the test. He endured under trial, whereas Israel did not. And so this 40 days is a period of testing the life of the disciples. They are being tested by Jesus, as it were, to see whether they are, they are ready for the task that is ahead of them for the day of Pentecost and the preaching of the gospel. We see as well in the Bible that God caused rain for 40 days and 40 nights in the time of Noah, in, in the time of the great flood, when God judged the world and tested the world and tested Noah and his family. And Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights when God gave to Moses the law. And when Israel was tested, when Moses was away from them, for 40 days. And Israel again failed the test by making a golden calf and questioning God in their hearts. And so Jesus here 
is revealing truth to his disciples in these 40 days as God revealed truth to Moses for 40 days on Mount Sinai. Whereas uh, the Father gave to Moses the law during these 40 days, Jesus the Son is giving to his disciples the gospel over this 40-day period, which alone can save us. And then 10 days later, Pentecost would occur. And Pentecost is also known as the Feast of Weeks. And it's called Pentecost because penta means five or 50. It would be 50 days after the Passover celebration. And so this Feast of Weeks would occur seven weeks plus one after Passover. And this Feast of Weeks would be the celebration of the harvest festival when the people would celebrate the harvest and the crop that God had given to them. And so Jesus in this period of 40 days would appear to many different people. He would appear to his disciples, but he would appear to others as well. In this 40 days, he would appear to the woman at the tomb. He would appear to Mary Magdalene. He would appear to the two, the two men on the road to Emmaus. He would appear to Peter in Jerusalem. He would appear to the 11 disciples. He would appear to, the, to seven of the disciples while they were fishing in Galilee and would appear to the 11 again in Galilee. He appeared to 500 brothers at one time, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He would appear to James, his own brother. And after his ascension into heaven, he would appear to Saul, who was a persecutor of the church, while he was on the road to Damascus seeking to put Christians in prison. And no one who saw the risen Christ could deny that he was alive. They saw with their very own eyes that Jesus Christ was risen. They could see him and could touch him and hear, could hear him speak. They could see with their very own eyes that he ate and he drank among them. So this was no hallucination. They were not hallucinating Jesus because a hallucination doesn't stay with you 40 days and eat and drink among you and talk and interact with you. One whom you can touch and can see that he indeed is, is alive. We hold to a faith that is built on eyewitness testimony and fulfilled prophecy. And the original disciples of Jesus, including James, his brother, and, and Paul, who at one time wanted to put the church to death, they could not deny what they had seen with their very own eyes. And they were willing to die as martyrs for what they knew was either the truth or a lie. And the evidence for Jesus increases our faith. Our faith is built up and encouraged and grown when we study Christian apologetics, when we study for ourselves the evidence for Christianity, and we see that the Christian faith is not like other religions that are built on the speculations of man, that are built on the philosophies of man and their sayings, but it is instead a faith that is built on recorded history in the Gospels and Acts, as well as the history of the Old Testament. It is based both on the words of Jesus and the actions and miracles of Jesus. And when we study Christian apologetics, we do so not only for ourselves, but also for the sake of others, because other people have questions about our faith. And when we study our faith in apologetics, we better equip ourselves to know how to give an answer to those who ask us and to help lead them to Christ by answering their objections. And it says here in this passage that Jesus taught them about the kingdom of God. But what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of God in the Bible describes the reign of God over his people. It is the rule of God over the hearts of those who believe in Jesus. And the church is part of God's kingdom. And the kingdom of God advances as the gospel is preached and people are changed and people are saved as they hear about Jesus and repent of their sins. God's kingdom advances through the ministry of the church. And as Christians, we are part of this kingdom. We are kingdom citizens. The Bible says that our citizenship is in heaven. We belong ultimately to heaven. Indeed, we are citizens of a nation on earth, but our chief citizenship is in heaven, not this world. And we await from heaven a savior. We have received from our savior forgiveness and eternal life. And God's kingdom will never pass away. 
it will never end. It is an eternal kingdom, but all of the kingdoms of this world and all the countries of this world will one day pass away. They will be no more, but God's kingdom will last for all of eternity, and we are privileged to be a part of that kingdom. And in one sense, God's kingdom is present here now. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is at hand, and he did miracles and signs and wonders as evidence that the kingdom is here in one sense. But in another sense, the kingdom has not yet arrived. The kingdom has not arrived in its fullness because we are still waiting for heaven. We are still waiting for the return of Christ and for him to establish his glorious kingdom. Jesus Christ is coming back one day, and his kingdom will last forever and ever and ever. And the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is a foretaste of God's kingdom. When we see the Holy Spirit change people's lives, we see what the kingdom of heaven is all about. And the church on earth is a foretaste of heaven. The church is a picture of heaven and what heaven will look like because the church, the body of Christ, will last forever. True Christians will be forever with God. We will be with one another forever and ever. And so when we gather together as the church, we do the same kind of things that we will do in heaven. We will worship God for all eternity in the new heavens and new earth. And so our worship together now in the body of Christ is a picture of what we will do for all eternity in worshiping and serving God. When we love one another and serve one another, that's a picture of the love we shall have for one another on that day. One day Jesus Christ will shepherd us. And so I as a pastor am a shepherd, but I'm just an under-shepherd. And my shepherding of you will come to an end one day. But Jesus Christ, as the great shepherd, will shepherd you perfectly for all eternity. And the Spirit of God transforms us and changes us to be better kingdom citizens. We are made kingdom citizens by the work of God in saving us. And the Spirit progressively changes us to make us more and more what we should be as citizens of the kingdom of God. And then after verses 2 and 3, Luke writes in verses 4 and 5 about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the words of Jesus. And so it says this in verses 4 and 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. After Jesus Christ ascends into heaven, he is going to bring to the past the promises that he has made to give to them the power of the Holy Spirit in its fullness and to equip them for ministry and to give to them these greater New Testament gifts. Jesus promised to give them a greater and a new work of the Spirit. And in John chapters 14 through 16, he talks about in great deal the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives today as Christians. Jesus told them in John 14, 26, but the helper or the advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit would help the disciples of Jesus remember his words to teach them to others, and the Holy Spirit would help them to write the Gospels. And so that way when they wrote the Gospels, they would remember the very words of Jesus exactly. And every word they would write down and speak would be exactly what God would want them to say. Jesus said as well in John 15, 26 through 27, But when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. The Holy Spirit would bear witness to Jesus through the miracles of the disciples. The Holy Spirit bears witness to Jesus through miracles. And I believe God does miracles even today that point to the truth of the Christian faith. We bear witness to Christ because the Holy Spirit does first. And we can only bear witness to Jesus because of the Holy Spirit inside of us, empowering us and gifting us. To do so. And Jesus also said in John 16, 12 to 13, 
Jesus told the disciples that I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak as a, on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And so the Holy Spirit, through the disciples and through others, would give to them a gift of prophecy. And through prophecy, they would foretell the future. And we see examples of that in the book of Acts. And these fulfilled prophecies would be additional evidence for the truth of the Christian faith. If someone claims to be a prophet of God, then if that is true, then every word that they say will come to pass. And if someone who claims to be a prophet says even one thing that does not come to pass, and that is evidence that they are not a true prophet of God, they are a false prophet, as Deuteronomy chapter 18 says. A true prophet of God will be right 100% of the time. And the Holy Spirit will protect the church from error. The Holy Spirit will guard and protect the church from error and will not allow false teachers and pro false prophets to gain a foothold in his church. And the work of the Holy Spirit is essential to the success of the, and mission of the church. We can accomplish nothing in the Christian life apart from the Spirit. We can do nothing in the Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit enabling us and empowering us for ministry. We can only help grow God's kingdom because of the gifts the Spirit has given to us. We need the Holy Spirit's power and anointing in our lives because we can do nothing apart from him. And that's why Jesus tells them to wait. Stay in Jerusalem until you have this New Testament power and anointing of the Spirit. Otherwise, they would fail in their, their mission. And we, too, need the Spirit's power in our lives. Without the Spirit, we would fail. We need to be filled with the Spirit's power in our lives. And so what does that look like? What does it mean to be full of the Holy Spirit? I think the Apostle Paul answers that question for us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. So Paul says this. He writes, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. This is what a spirit-filled person looks like. A spirit-filled person worships God and tells other people about God. A spirit-filled person is one who sings songs to God and always gives thanks to God for everything. They are, they are a person and a man of woman of piety. They worship God and give thanks to God. That is the result of being spirit-filled. It is not acting in an irrational or ecstatic manner. It is rather speaking to one another in praise to God. A sp spirit-filled person is one who repents of their sins and believes in Jesus and is focused on the worship of God. That is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is what we see in the book of Acts. We see people who are filled with the Spirit worshiping God and praying to God and crying out to God for God's help. And as a result of their prayers, God blesses them and shakes his church and empowers them for ministry so they can be effective witnesses for Jesus. And then it says in verse 5, Jesus reminds them that John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I would translate this verse differently from the way that it is here in the ESV. I would translate it instead, for John baptized in water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I would translate it in rather than with, because the Greek preposition that is used here, en, or en, is almost always translated in rather than with. The preposition en describes movement into something else to go into something. And so here, this is describing baptism or immersion in water. And so likewise, Jesus Christ baptizes or immerses us in his spirit. And so Jesus Christ here is the baptizer. He baptizes us, the subject, into the Holy Spirit, which is like the water. 
And so the Holy Spirit is not literally a substance like water. The Holy Spirit is personal. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. But it is a picture that shows us that when we are baptized into the Spirit, that that is a metaphor or picture to describe being submerged into the Spirit's power, being surrounded by the Spirit's power on all sides, so that we are emboldened and enabled to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus Christ immerses his church into the Spirit, but he will baptize the wicked in fiery judgment. He will immerse the wicked into the lake of fire one day at the final judgment. And so we are immersed into the Holy Spirit, but the unbelievers are immersed into judgment. They will receive hell on that day and be cast into the lake of fire. And so you will either be baptized into the Spirit or you will be baptized into hell. And the immersion of, into the Spirit by Jesus would equip the original disciples to become powerful witnesses for Christ. They would go from cowering in fear of the authorities to preaching Jesus Christ, even though it cost them their lives. And they did this for two reasons. They were able to do this first because they had a sincere conviction that Jesus Christ was alive. And secondly, because the Holy Spirit gave to them a special gift of boldness and courage to preach the gospel, even though it would cost them their lives. And as Christians today, we are called to continue their mission. We have the very same mission that they did, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to preach Jesus Christ crucified and not ourselves. We share the very same Holy Spirit that they had. We belong to the very same body of Christ that they did. Their history is our history. We belong to the same church. We belong to the very same body of Christ. We have the same spirit and the same power within us. And throughout history, Jesus Christ has changed the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Millions upon millions of people have been saved and transformed and changed by the Spirit. And God can do the very same thing for you. God can save you if you are lost. God can change you and give to you the same Spirit that was at work in the lives of the original disciples. Your story can become part of the story of church history. Your story can be added to the book of Acts, as it were. God is not done with this church yet. He is not done with us yet. And God wants to use you in this town for his glory. So let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the book of Acts. We thank you for this history that is recorded for us. And we pray that in this sermon series, we want to study it, study it like detached historians in a cold, unfeeling manner, but that we would study it in a very personal way that we would recognize that its history is our history, that this is our story, and that we are a part of it. And may we, your church, continue this story. May we continue, in one sense, the ministry of Jesus, as Jesus Christ moves through us as his body, that our words would be the words that Jesus Christ would want us to say, that our actions would be his actions through us. And we ask for these things in his holy name. Amen.